I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall we be saved from our enemies. We know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of our salvation be exalted. All did we know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of our salvation be exalted. We will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall we be saved from our enemies. We know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of our salvation be exalted. We know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of our salvation be exalted. We will call upon the Lord. Amen. All right. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, we approach you now uh, ever grateful for the blessings of this world, for the joy that we have in our hearts, and for the ability to come to you as children to the Father. We are overwhelmed every day, uh, given a new day, and we um, recognize how important you are for us and for uh, the entire world. Father, allow us to uh, recognize our talents, recognize what skills and opportunities are out there for us, and may we have those uh, skills put to use. May we recognize those moments where we share those skills with others or we give of our time or money and that we make an impact uh, to the community. Uh, we are here to be salt and light, and I pray that we do that for each other and we do that for the greater community at large. Please be with the people who are going to be serving us, serving the kids this evening. Uh, may they uh, have the ready words to speak. And may the lessons that are brought tonight be pleasing to you in your sight. Father, we love you. Again, we thank you for this time for us to come together as one, uh, to bring praises to you, uh, to lift up your name, uh, and to learn something. Father, it's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thanks, Evan. Good evening again. You guys ready for this? Last week we went through lesson four of the Is the Bible Reliable series entitled The United Kingdom of David and Solomon. We talked about what the Bible has to say when it comes to the Davidic monarchy, the growth and prosperity of Jerusalem in those times, the royal line of David, and all the extra biblical evidence supporting those claims. We were also told that the biblical view about the Davidic monarchy has been challenged by the skeptics. Wow. Of course, the biblical minimalist's view is that Saul and David may have existed, but if they did, it was only as leaders of small tribal confederations. Whoops. We... 
let's see. Okay, we learned about three extra biblical inscriptional references specifically to David. First, there was the Tell Dan, the Tell Dan Stella that attests to the house of David. Then there was the wall relief of Shoshank I that purports to refer to the highlands of David. And finally, there was the Misha Stella that also attests to the house of David. Again, it goes without saying that all three of these extra biblical inscriptional references are not without their controversies. However, it was the king of Moab. This is not what I'm about to tell you is, is not part of the Bible, right? It's extra biblical. It was the king of Moab who erected the Misha Stella. And Misha is also named as the king of Moab in 2 Kings 3, verse 4. This Stella also records how Omri, the king of Israel, defeated Moab, which corroborates what is recorded in 2 Kings 3, 4 through 5. The Misha Stella also mentions the Israel tribe of Gad. After that, we were introduced to the Kirka Stella of Shalmaneser III, which specifically mentions the Israelite king Ahab and the Syrian king Ben-Hadad, who was also mentioned in the Bible, 1 Kings 20, verse 33. And also the, the black obelisk of Shal Shalmaneser III, which not only mentions the Israelite king Omri, but also King Yehu, and shows a picture of him. And King Yehu is the one who's kissing feet, having to pay tribute to the, Ash to the Assyrian Shalmaneser III. So that guy right there, that's what's on the black obelisk. So pl plenty, plenty of evidence. Summing up lesson four, we saw that there's quite a bit of evidence of the Davidic monarchy. There's archaeological evidence that supports the existence of Jerusalem as a large, important, and fortified city in the 10th century B.C. There's archaeological evidence that supports both David's and Solomon's building projects. And there's evidence in inscriptions of David himself, the house of David, and the royal line of Judahite and Israelite kings. This is all quite contrary to the view of the biblical minimalist, which I've just told you about who say that David may have existed, but if he did, he wasn't a king and there was no Davidic monarchy as the Bible describes. And the view of the biblical nihilist textual critics who deny that there's any evidence of the existence of David at all. And as we've seen, last week's lesson covered the beginning of the long Davidic monarchy. This evening, we're going to look at what almost brought it to an end. And before we do that, just as a little pre-lesson exercise, who who know who knows the story and can and can quickly, briefly articulate it? What what almost brought it to an end? What almost brought the Davidic monarchy to an end? Anybody? Not not you, Helen. Because I know you, <laughs> I know, I want to know if other people, if they know before we go into the lesson. Do we know? Huh? No, come on. You don't even going to take, you, you don't want to even take a guess? What happened to Israel and Judah? Did anything ever happen to them? Nothing? Nothing ever happened to them. <laughs> Tell me. No one wants to do, no one wants to say anything. Okay. I'm going to do all the talking then. The David monarchy lasted more than 400 years and saw God's people become major players in the history of the Middle East. But the Bible also describes how they were unfaithful to the Lord which led to their punishment 
when both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah were attacked by the Assyrian Empire. I know, I know you guys know this from, from other Bible classes on the Old Testament. This lesson examines the archaeological record of Sennacherib's assault on Judah. We will learn how the evidence backs up the Bible's account of the defense of Jerusalem. God intervened in that siege when Judah's king Hezekiah turned to him for help. So again, we have actual historical events and a God who intervenes in human affairs. Let's look at the evidence of this amazing story by watching Lesson 5, Historicity of the Old Testament, A Tale of Two Conquests. So li let's, listen, I want, I, want, I want to do this before Dr. Meyer does because this is because this is absolutely amazing to me, okay? So, in Scripture, in both 2 Kings and Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles, okay, we have a story, a story of the Assyrian king Sennacherib, who at the time, the Assyrians were wiping out all the area. They were taking all these captives. They were capturing all these lands. They were um, uh, capturing all, uh, laying siege to all these walled cities, okay, Israelite cities and whatnot, and um, and and they were successful. They were successful at it, and they and they were getting all these captives, okay. Then they get to Jerusalem, where Hezekiah is the king, and. According to the Second Kings and Second Chronicles, they did not lay siege to Jerusalem. They weren't victorious over Jerusalem, right? They uh, they surrounded it, but Hezekiah had had built a tunnel to bring water into the city, and he paid a tribute to Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and got him to go away. Okay, that's what's in scripture, that story. So, 1500 years later, okay, what do they find? They find Sennacherib's account of the same thing. Not it, so they don't just, we don't just have the biblical account of it, which until they found that, everybody says, oh, it's all fictitious. They just made that stuff up. That, that didn't happen. That stuff didn't really happen. Now they find King Sennacherib's uh, war annals. Okay? And he describes the same thing. Of course, not exactly like it's described in the Bible. He, he embellishes some things. He he, his story is a little bit different in some of the details, but it happened. It happened. And they, ha they found three, not just one, but three of the clay cylinders where this story is on there. And it's, a, it, 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 it's verbatim from one cylinder to the other cylinder. And they were written uh, approximately 100 years apart. Okay. That is just, it's just fascinating to me, right? We had, we have, we already had the biblical account of it. Everybody was saying it's fictitious. And then they find extra biblical account of the same thing written, written by a different group of people. And it's talking about the same same thing mentions Hezekiah says I had says I had Hezekiah caged like a bird and he paid me a tribute. Now, what he says Hezekiah paid him and what the Bible says Hezekiah paid him are different, different in details. But the overall account of what happened is is the same. OK, and I wanted to tell you, I know you heard it. I know some of you when we went through this the first time heard it then. But those of you that haven't, I wanted to tell you before Dr. Me before Dr. Meyer did, because I because I think it is just so cool. Oh, this mouse.
The story of the Davidic monarchy, the line of kings descending from King David, gives us some of the most interesting stories in the entire Bible. Here we experience the full range of what it means to be human. Love, hate, glory, defeat, monumental building, destruction, fidelity to God, sin, and failure. These stories are presented to us as history in the Bible, so whether or not they really happened matters. In this lesson, I think some of the evidence for the stories written by the enemies of the Jews is some of the most interesting, but it's God's faithfulness and mercy that really puts a lump in my throat. See if you don't feel the same way. Today we're going to talk some more about the historicity of the Bible. We've been examining whether or not the Bible is historically reliable. In our last session, we were looking at the evidence for the historicity of the Davidic monarchy. And there we looked at the evidence concerning the beginning of that monarchy, whether or not David was even a real person of history, whether Solomon was a real person of history. We also looked at some of the kings that fell along the middle of those lines of kings. The Davidic monarchy, according to the Bible, stretched from about the year 1000 BC until it finally ended with the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 by the Babylonians. So it lasted for over 400 years in totality. Last time we saw evidence for the historical reliability of the accounts describing events at the beginning of the monarchy, and then later with other kings, both in the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, during the middle parts of the monarchy, that long line of kings. Now we're going to look at evidence of the events that terminated the monarchy. Now, this is what the biblical text has to say about this. In the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, in approximately 732 BC, the Assyrian Empire invades the northern kingdom of Israel. Then by 722 BC, it says that Israel has been defeated and King Hoshea has been taken captive. Then in about 701 BC, the Assyrians decide it's time for a new assault. And they come against Judah, which by this time is headed by King Hezekiah. And they come and they conquer the strong-walled cities of Judah, leaving only Jerusalem, and then they initiate a siege against Jerusalem. And that's the story that we're going to tell today. First of all, before we get into that, though, let's just check the first two parts of this story. And let's put it in geographic context. We've got this really nice map here, and we can see that Assyria is one big dude. This is not an empire you want to be messing with. You've got the tiny little kingdoms of Israel in the south and the even tinier kingdom of Judah further to the south of that. And when Assyria comes in 732, Israel does its best, but within 10 years, it has been carted off into captivity. And we know that both from the cylinders recording the Assyrian battles, their campaigns, as they were called, and also because we have records of Israelites in the military records of the Assyrians from later on. They were apparently conscripted into the Assyrian military once they were taken captive. So we know that they were conquered, that they were deported, and that they lived for some significant period of time in Assyria. We also know that this last king of, of Israel was a real guy of history. His name was Hoshea. We found the seal, a little signet ring, bearing his name and the name of one of his officials, Abdi, servant of Hoshea. So we've got great extra biblical corroboration of the existence of this last king and of the defeat that he experiences at the hands of the Assyrians and the subsequent deportation of his people. Okay, so then the story progresses. And in 701 BC, 21 years later, we have Sennacherib coming against Judah. Judah now stands alone. And it says that he came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. So you think about this, you got Jerusalem in the, in the center of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, but now Sennacherib comes and he conquers all the other cities. 
Do we know that happened? Absolutely. We know it from Sennacherib's prism. He says, as for Hezekiah, the Judean, who did not submit to my yoke, I surrounded and conquered 46 of his strong-walled towns by leveling with battering rams and by bringing up siege engines. 200,150 people I brought away from them and counted as spoil. Now, there's a beautiful mural that's been discovered in Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the mural shows the siege of Lachish, one of those Judean cities. And it shows in exquisite detail just amazing things. Here's a little more of the text. He says, I overwhelmed the district of Hezekiah of Judah, Azekah, his stronghold, which is located between my land and the land of Judah. As you're approaching Jerusalem, you have to come through the mountain pass that goes through Azekah and Lachish. These are the last cities to fall. Sennacherib here brags specifically about destroying Azekah. We know that that fell from the biblical text. But we know that Lachish was under siege from the biblical text. It says that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem while he was besieging Lachish. Now, as I mentioned, there's this mural that's been discovered in Nineveh that shows the siege of Lachish. See the little picture to the right. What these are is guys who have been killed, who have been impaled on spears. Okay, this is very grisly stuff. Okay, they didn't have moving cameras for the, you know, the six o'clock news, they, but they made murals depicting what happened in these battles. The siege of Lachish also shows these siege ramps. Probably the angle is not realistic. It's a little too, too tight, but you see all the Assyrian archers coming up the siege ramps, all the Assyrian arrows firing. And we know that Lachish eventually fell. And in fact, excavations of Lachish from this period have uncovered about 1,500 skulls and hundreds of Assyrian arrowheads. Some of these are kind of stylized, but if you can see this guy here, this is one fiery soldier. This is a gnarly dude here. Uh, and <laughs> look, look at the hairdos. I mean, the, the Assyrians had a very distinctive style of braiding their beards and their hair. The precision, the realism of these, it, it grabs you. It takes you back to that period of time. These events really happen. You've got the biblical claim that Lachish is put under siege. You've got the Assyrian campaign cylinders saying the same thing. You've got the Assyrian murals actually depicting the battle. And then you've got the excavation site from that time showing the remains of the battle, the dead and the arrowheads that produced the dead. Did it happen? No question, no question. Now, the story gets more interesting. The 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. And then the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshaka from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. Do you get the scene? What remains? Only Jerusalem. This massive empire has now conquered all the surrounding cities in Judah, and only one city remains, the capital. And that's where Hezekiah is. So Hezekiah, seeing this, first attempts to buy time and to buy off Sennacherib. So the first thing he does is he pays tribute. And we have this recorded in the Bible. And interestingly, it's also in Sennacherib's records. The king of Assyria required Hezekiah, king of Judah, to pay 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver which was found in the house of the Lord in the treasuries of the king's house. So the first thing he does is he pays tribute. And then we have that confirmed in the Taylor prison where Sennacherib himself says, Hezekiah there felt a fear of the power of my arms, and he sent out to me the chiefs and the elders of Jerusalem with 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver and diverse treasures. So we know from the Taylor prism that this, this part of the biblical account is correct. Slight discrepancy into, as to how much the, the tribute was. Uh, Sennacherib seems to say it was more, but that kind of is consistent with the, the braggadocia. In any case, both the biblical record and the Assyrian records record this tribute being paid. But now Hezekiah realizes that's, that's not gonna get the job done. All his cities have now been conquered and we have Sennacherib sending his troops. They're surrounding Jerusalem and that's where we're gonna pick up the story in the biblical text itself. And I wanna read you an incredible passage. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, right at the beginning. And it says, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, 
Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then they worked hard, repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. And he built another wall outside that one and reinforced the supporting terraces of the city of David. And he also made large number of weapons and shields. Later, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Hezekiah says, the Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria, he is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. Did not Hezekiah himself remove this God's high places and altars, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before one altar and burn sacrifices on it? What's his argument here? Hezekiah has been trying to, to get you to stop doing idols, but has it done you any good? I've conquered all the rest of your country. And then he goes on to say, do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Like the impalement we just saw, pretty scary stuff. Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my fathers destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? We're going to see it's right at the city walls. They're coming right up to the, the, the walls of Jerusalem. And they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall. You get the picture? This is a siege. There's a high wall protecting the city. The Assyrians... Their officials, with the, no doubt the military accumulating behind them, are taunting the people inside this last remaining stronghold from just below them where the people are up on the wall. And they're taunting them in their own language. Now I'm going to 2 Kings where there's a parallel account. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and listen to the words of Sennacherib, who has insulted the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned after men's hands. Now, O Lord, your God, deliver us from his hands so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, our God. What we find is now the prophet Isaiah comes and he, he gives a word to Hezekiah and it comes through the prophet. And this is what he says. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant whom we now know was a real person of history. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. And so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew, and he returned to Nineveh and stayed there. And one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, and his sons Adramelech and Sherezer cut him down with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Ezra Hayden, his son, succeeded him as king. Dramatic story. Dramatic story. Did it really happen? Well, let's take another look. According to the text, Hezekiah does these four things. He pays tribute, he builds a defensive wall, he secures a water supply, and finally he consults the prophet who tells them it's all going to be all right. That's the prophecy from Isaiah. Let's look at the historical record. First thing we know is there was a water tunnel. Hezekiah made the pool in a tunnel which he brought water into the city. This was his first defensive fortification. That tunnel has been discovered. It connects the pool of Siloam inside the city of Jerusalem with the spring of Gihon. The tunnel dates from this period, about 700 BC. In fact, an inscription has been found on the inside of the tunnel that describes the way the builders, the stone cutters, working from two different directions, obviously in haste, 
somehow, and we're still not sure, found each other to connect. And when they connected, they wrote the following inscription. The stone cutters struck each man towards his fellow, axe against axe, and the waters flowed from the source to the pool for about 1,200 cubits. And 100 cubits was the height of the rock above the head of the stone cutters. So they're 100 cubits underground, about 180 feet underground. They've somehow accomplished this amazing engineering feat. They're building in haste, cutting in haste from two directions to connect the pool inside the city to the source of water outside. It's a very difficult engineering feat without you know, GPS satellites or something. So in any case, this water tunnel about which we read in scripture has been discovered. We can even date it very precisely. This was Hezekiah's tunnel. Okay. Now, secondly, we learn that Hezekiah strengthened the defensive fortifications and then he built another broad wall, another wall around the city. When I was in Jerusalem, I was on a tour with a guide and he took us to this incredible broad wall and he read a passage from Isaiah, which was talking about how this wall was constructed in haste. And he said, you raise the wall and cut down the houses. And we were standing at a place where you could see this wall actually cutting through, cross-cutting through pre-existing houses. And you could see that it had been built in haste. There was a tremendous amount of rubble poured into the middle of this. And this is the defensive fortification that, of which the Bible speaks. And this is the, the wall that Hezekiah built, also dating from this period, about 700 B.C. Okay, so we know that there was a wall. We know that there was the, the fortification. What about this deliverance? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. According to the Bible, an angel of the Lord came in the middle of the night and caused 185,000 Assyrians to die. Perhaps there was some confusion. They started to fight among themselves. We don't know. And therefore, there was no conquest of Jerusalem, despite the fact that the most powerful empire in the world was now laying siege to this city and this city which had no other means of support, military support. All the other cities in Judah had been conquered. What, what would you think the Assyrians would record? about this event. If the Bible was wrong, don't you think they would record that the city had been conquered? Okay, all right. Let's see what they do record. It's very interesting. Uh, according to the, the Taylor Prism, I call this conspicuous silence. This is Sennacherib. He himself I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city like a bird in a cage. Fear of my lordly splendor overwhelmed that Hezekiah. The warriors and select troops he had brought in to strengthen his royal city in Jerusalem did not fight. And I went on to conquer Jerusalem. No, it doesn't say that. Now, you see, he records every single other city he conquered, all 46 of them. He records every person he took into captivity, all 200,150 of them. But he says nothing about conquering Jerusalem. Why would that be? He didn't conquer. It's embarrassing. It's an embarrassing fact of history for him, isn't it? In fact, it goes further than that. Sennacherib's assassination by his sons is recorded on an Assyrian stella called the Chronicle of Nabonassar. Let's take stock of this incredible account that we have in scripture and how it stacks up against the extra biblical evidence that we've also looked at. We have, again, one of these convergent lines of testimony. We've got six specific things about which both the biblical text and the secular archeological records and the documentary evidence from the Assyrian records uh, both agree. We've got things that both sources of information claim about Hezekiah. We've got things that both sources of information claim about Sennacherib. And here's the list. Both Hezekiah and the extra biblical record claim that Hezekiah fortified the walls of Jerusalem. We know that from the biblical text. We've seen the archaeological evidence of the fortified walls, the broad wall in Jerusalem. We've seen that both the biblical text and the archaeological record document that he secured a water supply by building a tunnel from underneath the city, going from the spring of Gihon into the pool of Siloam. We see that both the biblical record and Sennacherib's cylinder, his record of his own military campaigns, agree that Hezekiah paid tribute initially to buy time, to buy off Sennacherib. We see that the biblical record and the extra biblical record agree about the actions of Sennacherib. We see that both agree that he conquered the walled cities of Judah. Sennacherib numbers them, 46. The biblical record does not. Uh, but we have agreement on that essential point. We see that Sennacherib did not conquer Jerusalem. We see that very clearly explained in the biblical record. And we see that confirmed by the conspicuous silence in Sennacherib's own 
record of his military campaigns recorded in the Taylor prison. And then interestingly, we also have evidence that he withdrew from both sources of information and that he was killed by his rebellious sons. That's recorded in 2 Kings 19, but also we saw it in that Assyrian documentary evidence. So we have substantial agreement on these six key points about this siege of Judah and Jerusalem that comes from the Assyrian superpower. So now let's step back and look at one other thing. We know that Hezekiah exists from the biblical text. We know that he exists from the Taylor prism. He's mentioned in both sources. But we now have discovered, or archaeologists have discovered, personal artifacts, personal effects of King Hezekiah himself. Those effects are what are called boule. Boule is plural for the term bula, which refers to a little clay stamp. These little clay stamps have writing on them in the Paleo-Hebrew, in the old form of Hebrew. And what happened in ancient biblical times, in the time period of the kings, the Davidic monarchy, is that kings and their officials would wear these little rings. And they'd have this cool ancient style of Hebrew writing. And then if they wanted to seal an ancient document, they would press it into a little bit of clay like this. This is actually Play-Doh, but you know, it'll get the job done. Okay. And then inside that seal, you would have the certification of the official, his name and title. All right. Now, archaeologists have discovered not one, but three separate boule with the following words. Belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Let's step back and take a big picture look at what we've been doing. We've been looking at the historicity of the Bible in, in sections and evaluating each of these portions of biblical, of biblical narrative. And we've seen that there are different hypotheses about the nature of the text. One hypothesis is the hypothesis of the biblical nihilism who claim that the Old Testament narrative has no historical value. And the first person that we saw who advanced that view, do you remember his name? Julius Wellhausen. And then we talked about the literary critic Thompson yesterday, who denies that David even exists. I think the evidence against biblical nihilism is overwhelming. And I think we've seen that. The next view is the view of the biblical minimalists, who are only a little bit more favorable towards the Bible. They claim it may contain a tiny historical core. For example, Israel Finkelstein says the exodus didn't happen, the conquest didn't happen, David may have existed, but he was only a minor tribal official. Okay. Well, I think we've presented some very compelling evidence against that view. When we get to this period of the end of the Davidic monarchy, guess what happens? The, the minimalists say almost nothing about this. There are no significant challenges to the historicity of these narratives. Why would that be the case? There is such an overwhelming body of evidence in their favor. And I think when you look at the whole swath of biblical history from the patriarchs forward, and you consider the preponderance of the evidence, I, my own assessment is that this is not a credible view. That leaves two other possible views. The view of biblical maximalism, which is the view that the Bible contains a substantial core of historically reliable information, which I think is a very credible view in light of everything we've seen. And then a view that goes somewhat further and says the Bible is divinely inspired and true in everything it affirms, both about theology and about miraculous events for which there is not direct attestation. And that view is based on a number of things, some of which we have presented, the historical reliability, the external corroboration of the text. But to make that argument, I think you need some additional ammunition. And we, we may get to that in an additional part of this course down the road. But for right now, I would say that these two views are both consistent with the evidence. Both are possible views. Next time, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the tale of the other conquest, where there is, again, a dramatic and tragic element in the story, but also an extensive extra biblical record of corroborating evidence that gives us even more confidence that the Bible is reliable in its historical affirmations. So whatever happened to Sennacherib? Well, he moved the capital of the Assyrian Empire to Nineveh, modern day Iraq. There he built a palace without rival. It was almost 2000 feet long, 70 feet tall the ruins of which have provided us a wealth of archaeological artifacts. Sennacherib defended Nineveh with a moat and high walls, portions of which can even be seen today. 
The irony is that despite all of these fortifications, Sennacherib was assassinated by his own two sons. Hey, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, will you get those? That's pretty cool, huh? About the Sennacherib's prison. The he referred to it as the Taylor prison. Let me um, let me show you something real quick. Can you see that? So they found. So they found three of them, Taylor Prism, Oriental Institute Prism, Jerusalem Prism. That, so Taylor is the guy that found it, right? Oriental Institute is where it's at, and Jerusalem Prism is where it's at. That's why they name them like that. But they're all Sennacherib's prisms, okay? They're from the annals of Sennacherib. And you can, you can read up there what I've typed up about them. Um, but, but anyway, so th this is what I think is so cool, right? So here you have these, what's been called biblical nihilists and biblical minimalists, right? The Bible's fiction, at most, there's a couple of, there might be a couple of historical things in there, right? And then somebody, somebody finds these things. And then somebody who knows how to read this, I think it was in uh, what they call a cuneiform. Somebody, there's not, I mean, it's not like there's a whole bunch of people that can read these things, okay? There's only a handful of people that can read this stuff. So, so here we go. These guys come along and gals and, and they start reading this stuff. And then they start seeing things like, Hezekiah, right? They'll start seeing things on there like Hezekiah. Oh, that, is that, isn't that from the Bible? And now, now all of a sudden they're all quiet, right? You don't hear, you don't hear, you don't hear a peep from them about how, oh, the Bible's all fictitious and it's, there's no, there's no historical value whatsoever. According to Dr. Meyer, he, he's, he's telling us, you don't hear, you don't hear a peep from them now. They're not, they're, they're not trying to dispute anything now, right? Because they, th this is all extra biblical stuff. And it was recorded by another, the Assyrians, not the Isra Israelites, not any of them. And then here, here's, another, here's another point, right? So the story talks about, are the, in Sennacherib's annals, in the prisms, he talks about how he that um, none of the gods of the other cities that he conquered were able to stand up against him. Okay, what? Who belonged to most of the cities that he was conquering? Huh? The Israelites. Idol worship. They were they were idol worshippers, right? They they were being idol worshippers. So when we, you ever so when you ask yourself the question, or someone asks the question, why did God allow them to be conquered and taken to a captivity? Um, because they had left God. They were they had become idol worshippers. Okay, and uh, you notice what Sennacherib said, and, and this is in the the biblical account, but you notice what Sennacherib said. He, he went past going up against King Hezekiah. Who was he going up against? Who did he say he was going up against? 
He was going, I want to hear you guys say it. You guys tell me. Who did Sennacherib, from what you heard in there, who did Sennacherib say he was going up against? Did he say he was going up against Hezekiah? What did he say? Help, come on. Come on. Say God with me. Say God. He said he was going up against God. That's what he said. And when Hezekiah prayed to God, how, how did he appeal to God? Did he, did he say, hey, I want this victory for myself? Or did he kind of pray more like what you've heard David's prayer was? Where this guy is trying to defy you, the living God, and I want you to defend yourself. That, that type of attitude, right? That, that's what's going on. That's what's going on here. And this is, this is what's so important, okay? I want us to get this in our minds. Even if you just take, you've just taken it for granted all these years, this is not just a story that, that, that the Jews made up for, to, to, to have something in their history. This is not just something that they made. This stuff happened. It actually happened. This stuff happened, okay? Just like the day of Pentecost and the other things, God is working in the world to save his people. Then he's working in the world to save his people now. God is doing things in the world to save his people, and he's doing those things through his people. Okay, I'll... I'll tone down the preaching and let's do some, let's do our exercise. It's easier to go back this way, even though I'm going to give you some of the answers. Okay. Um, question number one. The Davidic monarchy stretched from about the year 1000 B.C., Till it finally ended with the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC by the. You want to go with that? You want to go with that? Does everybody agree with that? Babylonians? We're going to go with Babylonians? No objections? Babylonians, it is. Why is my thing not working? Because I didn't turn it on. Babylonians, it is. Okay. In about 701 B.C., following the conquest of Israel, the Assyrians moved on to attack the kingdom of... Who said that? Very good. Okay, number three. Blank is one big dude. This is not an empire you want to be messing with. Huh? Anybody? I didn't hear you. Assyria. Everybody agree with that? No objections? Just tell me if you object. No. Assyria. Okay. We found the seal, a little signet ring, bearing his name and the name of one of his officials, Abdi, servant of... He's a king of Israel. Servant of... Huh? Nope. Any, any other takers? Starts with an H. No. The other, the other H. <laughs> Hoshia. Okay, as you're approaching Jerusalem, you have to come through the mountain pass that goes through blank and Lachish. Lachish, however you want to pronounce it. I think somebody said it earlier. Starts with an A. No one? Didn't somebody say Azaka? Did I hear someone say Azaka? Okay. Next group. Come on, Ryan. I think that wasn't my fault. All right. X. <laughs> yeah, you better get these now. 
One of you, somebody should have took out their phone. Excavations of blank have uncovered about 1,500 skulls and hundreds of Assyrian arrowheads. Come on, you guys just saw it. Lachish, good. An angel of the Lord came in the middle of the night and caused how many Assyrians to die? From the biblical account. He said it. You want to take a guess? Ha, 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 who said that? He said 185,000. Is there have any takers? Any objections to 185,000? Good job. Okay, there was no <clears throat> there was no conquest of blank, despite the fact that the most powerful empire in the world was now laying siege to this city. We said Jerusalem, right? The blanks say almost nothing. Who? I told you a couple of times. The minimalists. Right? Okay. There are blank significant challenges to the historicity of these. And I want some props for how fast I did that. It's pretty fast, right? It's pretty fast at that. Okay. Um, all right, let's do the matching. You ready for this? The last king of Israel, the northern kingdom. What goes there? I'll give you a hint. We just said his name not too long ago. Starts with an H, and it wasn't Hezekiah. There you go. Good job. Good job. A Syrian king that was assassinated by his own sons and has prisms. What? Sennacherib. Good. Judean city that Sennacherib brags about destroying. We said that before, too. It's not Lachish. <laughs> it's the other one. What's the other one? Azekah, number of fenced Judean cities that Sennacherib conquered. Good job. Southern kingdom with Jerusalem as capital. Huh? Yes, Judah. Good job. I can't get this to scroll. Oh, Brian, what's happening here? There we go. The king of Judea who trusted God. That one's Hezekiah, right? Jerusalem's source of water while under attack. Hezekiah's tunnel. Did everybody hear that? Who said that answer? Good job. Part of Hezekiah's tribute to Sennacherib. Who said that? 30 talents of gold. Very good. Sennacherib's failure to mention conquering Jerusalem. Conspicuous silence. And then the last one's a gimme, right? Where Assyrian arrowheads have been discovered. Lachish. Okay. Here's one of those 50-point uh, extra questions. So remember this question? 
uh, our statement. We found the seal, a little signet ring bearing his name and the name of one, his official, <clears throat> and the name of one of his officials, Abdi, servant of Hoshea. How likely does it seem that we would ever find something as small as a signet ring belonging to none other than a king of Israel? Do you think the Lord is involved in archaeology? So they want us. We have a few minutes before I need to close this with a prayer. So they want us to discuss this. You want to discuss this or you want me to move on to another question? We don't have to discuss this one. We have others we can discuss. I would like to discuss it, but I think others would like to discuss it. Huh? Yeah, I would say that. So, so do we or do we not believe that God was involved in preserving what we have for Scripture? Was he involved in that? Or, or j j is that just by accident? So we think he was involved in that, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to saying that he's involved in preserving some things that help, that help us to persuade other people that Scripture is not just made up. I, I, wouldn't have, I don't have a problem with that. Does anybody have a problem with that? Huh? I think, yeah, I have no problem with thinking the Lord is involved in that. Okay. We have a minute and a half. There was no conquest of Jerusalem, despite the fact that the most powerful empire in the world was now laying siege to the city. God doesn't always intervene to give us victory over our enemies. Why do you think he did so this time, but not when the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem years later? And I'm going to give you a hint before Rod says anything. Rod's already answered this question in his lesson this morning. So if you were paying attention to his lesson this morning, he already answered this. He already answered, well, I'll put it to you this way. He gave a very good answer to this. I'm sure there's more than one answer to this, but he gave a very good answer to this. Okay, now remember, every, all the cities, all the cities in that area were taken captive. All of them, except for Jerusalem, okay? All of Israel, gone. Taken into captivity. Only Judah remains. Jerusalem, okay? And they were attacked and taken into captivity by who? Huh? You said you made, you gave an answer earlier, the very first answer, Babylonians. So the Babylonians got Jerusalem years later, okay? Approximately 100 years later. Get, not quite 100, but close, okay? So... For about 80, 80 to 100 years, Jerusalem was still Jerusalem. They were still serving God. They weren't taken captive. And why is that? So I'm just going to give you the real short answer. That's why I said Rod answered some of this in his lesson this morning. The Lord is being patient towards you because he does not wish for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So all the, all the Israelites were being taken to captivity. Why? Because what did Sennacherib say? I took all their, I crushed all their idols, all, I, all their gods. None of their gods could stand up against me. So this means they were worshiping all these other gods. So they have taken it captivity. Sennacherib is going up against the living God, the only God. Hezekiah prays to him to, just for lack of a better term right now, to defend himself and show Sennacherib who he is and who his people are. Hezekiah had that kind of relationship with him, right? So God spared them for 80 to 100 years, but, but 
did did they take did they take warning about what happened to Israel? Did they did they pay heed to that and say, "Hey, man, we better we better get our act together and keep our act together because if we don't, look what happened to Israel is going to happen to us." Did they do that? They did not do that. They did not do that. And so they were taken. But for 80 to 100 years, patience of the Lord. Okay? Patience of the Lord for them to do that. But they did. But they did not. Okay? I got I got to I got to do it. We got to close with the prayer. I, I went over time. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, it was good for us to be here this evening, and we thank you for the time we've spent together gathered in the name of your Son. We thank you for making it possible to discover the artifacts that we've talked about this evening and for those who devote their lives looking for these things. We also thank you for the courage you have given all those who bring these things out to the public, showing an unbelieving society that the scripture you have inspired and preserved can be trusted that these things really happen, that you in fact exist and you have worked throughout history and continue to work in this world to save your people. We pray that you would give us the courage to engage this culture, speaking the truth you have given us, that we will work towards a closer relationship with you and work towards bringing others into a relationship with you, being agents of redemption and reconciliation through the righteousness that you have inaugurated through your son. As we eagerly await the full realization of your coming kingdom, we pray that we will go through the remainder of our days in the spirit of Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.